Praise the Lord, and welcome to this edition of a series of daily broadcasts which we have tagged the State of the Union. Praise the Lord. And we are still about the business of the word of the Lord saying, tell my people to return to me. Tell my people to return to me. And in the last two weeks or so, we have been looking at the business of the wisdom of God. So that it will sound something like, tell my people to return to my wisdom. And more specifically, we have been looking at the various expressions of wisdom. And if you are joining us for the first time, I can only say that you avail yourself of the recorded versions of this series of broadcasts so that you can be in the flow. So we have looked at the business of understanding. We have looked at the business of prudence. And then we started to look at the business of self-control as an expression of the wisdom of God. Self-control. And yesterday we looked at one or the first of two principles which I propose to share with us to help our understanding of the business of self-control and how it is an expression of the wisdom of God. And yesterday we submitted a very simple expression of a principle that self-sacrifice is the expression of God manifest in self-control. Self-sacrifice is the expression of God in Christ manifest in self-control. And so we looked at certain things Jesus said, how that whoever must follow him, must, whoever must be his disciple, and a disciple is a follower, and a follower is one who obeys the word of the master. So if we must follow him, we must give up something of ourselves. We must forsake or deny ourselves. That right there is the ingredient of self-sacrifice. Every time you have to obey God, every time you have to follow the leading of the Spirit, something of yourself is sacrificed because your natural senses can propel you in a different direction. A direction apparently more advantageous than the direction that the Holy Spirit may be leading you in. And if we let that flow into today, and every time we do something that is contrary to what the flesh is saying, especially in self-sacrifice and therefore in self-control, it tends to put us in an apparent situation of weakness. It makes us look weak. And this is the reason the flesh fights the spirit. It makes us look silly, stupid, like we don't know what we are doing. It tends to put us in a seeming disadvantage. So God says to Joshua, circumcise all the Israelites, and they are right in front of the Jordan, surrounded by their enemies. How do you circumcise a grown man in the presence of his enemies? That is a very severe risk because if those enemies attack, you are going to look silly. Lame dog. You can't help yourself. And it's going to be because of something that you did or something that you allowed. So self-control kicks in to deny your natural senses having their way. So if we progress straight away into to this matter, 
we can immediately say, for example, that self-control is simply controlling yourself. Really. It simply comes down to that, controlling yourself. And every time you have to control yourself, it is because yourself wants to express itself in some way or the other. And so by the exercise of the will, you choose to go in a different direction. And oftentimes, choosing to go in that direction makes it look like we have disadvantaged ourselves. We have weakened ourselves. We have put ourselves in an untenable position not beneficial to us. That's how it will look, at least at the outset. And many times, this position of weakness has led to some kind of suffering or the other, whether it be just mental deprivation, the mental torture, or actual physical suffering. it has often resulted in a position of weakness and therefore suffering. Therefore, let us quickly clear up one thing. Let us not confuse Christian suffering, which is the result of self-sacrifice, with Christian suffering, which is the result of spiritual warfare. They are not exactly the same. It's suffering is suffering, you are at some kind of disadvantage. But Christian warfare, a Christian suffering, which is the result of self-sacrifice or self-control, if you like, characteristically, there is something you could or could have done about the situation. You chose not to in obedience to one thing or the other which God has said, especially as manifest in Christ. Christian suffering, which comes from self-control or self-sacrifice, is often the result of a decision that we have made because of one or the other tenet of Christ. For example, love your neighbor. Do not exalt yourself above anybody else. Let others eat before you serve yourself. Put in others first. Now, the obedience to such commandment or such position in Christ is a choice of ours because we could have chosen to act in our favor over and above anything else. But if you serve your neighbor first, or if you serve other people first, by the time you come around to serving yourself, you may not even have the strength to do so. You may not even have the resources left to do so. Or you may not even have a family to take care of after you have expended yourself in the service of others. Now, that is the kind of risk involved in the Christian suffering as a result of self-sacrifice. It is usually the result of something demanded or required of us in Christ. On the other hand, suffering as a result of spiritual warfare, we are not exactly powerless. We are not exactly left helpless. We can actually do something about spiritual warfare. So suffering from spiritual warfare is, I dare say, almost an unnecessary experience. Because we have been empowered to do something about that one. We have been given wisdom, we have been given gifts, we have been given different expressions of grace. 
who have been given spiritual weapons, like the word of God and prayer, for example, like what we are discussing now, for example, the wisdom of God. But we have also been given authority to do the enemies with damage. We cannot preach, I love my neighbor, to the devil. We cannot preach, love the, any, love the devil as yourself, because he's out to wreak havoc. We have been given tools, equipment, to tear that kingdom down. Now, when you don't, for whatever reason, ignorance, perhaps, Suffering which results thereby is not the suffering that we refer to as Christian suffering. Christian suffering primarily arises from something about being a Christian, denying yourself to follow or to obey Christ. Let's be clear about that. Now, somebody may be watching this and hearing us say that self-sacrifice and self-control are the bedrock of the expression of the wisdom of God in self-control. And you think that in the name of self-control, you refuse to do damage to the enemy's camp, to the devil. You have authority to pull down strongholds. You have authority to bind a strong man. You have authority to force open doors which are shut in your face. You have authority to force territories open. Now, when we refuse and we suffer as a result, now that's our fault. That's not Christian suffering as a result of self-control. All right. Having cleared that up, let us look at principle number two. We looked at principle number one yesterday, which is that self-sacrifice is at the bottom of the matter of following Christ. When he listed the conditions, that was the very first one he said, if any man must come after me, let him deny himself pick up his cross and follow me. Self-sacrifice is at the bottom of self-control. Because every time you hold yourself in check, every time you restrain yourself, which is what we generally refer to as self-control, every time you do that, you could have chosen not to. But in choosing to hold yourself in check, you sacrifice your, your position, your right, your privilege to act. Principle number two. In the oppression of the wisdom, in the oppression of the wisdom of God in self-sacrifice and therefore self-control, there is the matter according to the scriptures of my strength is made perfect in weakness. Let me introduce the portion of scripture in question. Second Corinthians chapter 12. And we begin to read it from verse 5. Now Paul is talking about something. And then in verse 5 he starts to say, he says, of, short, of such an one will I glory. Yet of myself I will not glory, but in my infirmities. Let's generally call that weakness and suffering. He says he will glory in his weakness. For though I would desire to glory, I shall not be a fool. For I will say the truth, but now I forbear. You see, I can do it, I can say the truth, but I choose to hold myself. Lest any man should think of me above that which he seeth me to be or that he hear it of me. This is self-control in action. 
In other words, I can speak. I can speak of myself in the experiences which I have had in the Lord. But I choose not to. Now, in our understanding of Christian suffering, which is the result of Christian sacrifice, the man is saying, if I speak the truth of my experiences in Christ, I'm going to appear strong. But in choosing not to, he's going to look weak. If you read the whole story of Ephesians, of, of Second Corinthians chapter 12, you get the picture. He is addressing those people who have chosen to speak of themselves, comparing themselves with themselves. Okay. So in verse 7, unless I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in my flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I will rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Paul is describing Christian suffering resulting from self-sacrifice, resulting from certain choices made. Christian suffering resulting from self-control. Christian suffering resulting from obeying Christ. Paul understood that in the weakness which apparently ensues when we obey Christ, when we choose the way of Christ, in the apparent weakness which follows, he understood that the strength of God is made perfect. So he says, most gladly, therefore, I will rather glory in my weakness so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, we must understand that as we engage obedience in self-sacrifice, it immediately puts us in a seemingly weak position or in a seeming position of weakness. Every time you choose what God wants, especially when you want to act and you realize he doesn't want you to act, it puts us in a position of seeming weakness. It looks like you are weak. It looks like you can't defend yourself. It looks like you can't help yourself. It looks like you have nothing to say. Others are talking and making jest of you and you keep quiet. They don't know you are restraining yourself. They think you don't have words in your mouth. Now, when we refuse to speak, when we refuse to act, it tends to give them encouragement to continue doing what they are doing because they see us as weak. But Paul is trying to tell us something, that in that weakness, the power of Christ is made perfect. <clears throat> you see, the self generally feels strong when it is able to do as it pleases. Let me say that again. The flesh or the self feels strong when it is able to do as it pleases. To restrain it, therefore, or to deny it this ability to do as it wishes is to weaken it and to put it in apparent disadvantage. This is why the self so much resists self-sacrifice and this business of self-control. Let me quickly say this, as it's coming up right now in my, in my mind or in my spirit. You see, when you restrain yourself as an act of self-control, and you refuse to say that thing that is right at the tip of your tongue to say, 
you are you seem to be under pressure to say it you you have to say it because you need to say something every time you end up saying that thing your body generally tends to gravitate in the direction of what you have said now that pleases the flesh it wants to do as it likes but when you manage to restrain yourself in self-control, now your body has to come under subjection and sit down. Now herein is the struggle. Herein is the struggle. In being restrained, the flesh behaves as somebody who is being denied something. And so it starts to complain. It starts to be, it starts to grumble. Things the Lord hates in particular. So the self generally restricts or, or, or resists self-sacrifice because it makes it feel weak. Especially when you know you can do something, you can say that thing, you can, you can lash out, you can, you can talk back. But if the strength of God is perfected in weakness, then we can see the advantage in weakness. Especially weakness resulting from obeying God. It puts us in line for the demonstration of the power of God. Which one do you prefer? To act without restraint because your flesh demands action from you or to restrain yourself and then let God act in your behalf because when God acts in your behalf nobody can come and fight you now that you retaliated or you did this and that it will be clear to everybody that God has acted in your favor now that's going to make them fear you more But when you choose to be without restraint, now you are not different from whoever you are replying. The power of God is not needed when you have already exhibited strength in what you have said or in what you have done. Now this is the second principle. The first one, self-sacrifice and therefore self-control are at the base of the expression of God, expression of the wisdom of God is self-control. Today, principle number two, in the apparent weakness of self-sacrifice and therefore self-control, the power of God is made manifest. But because we don't know this, we generally find it difficult to restrain ourselves. See, when we are apparently weakened in obedience and self-sacrifice, which is produced or expressed in self-control, there is only one possibility that can then be expressed. The power of God finds expression in the weakness of self-sacrifice and self-control. Now here is the wisdom. Every time you go the way of self-sacrifice in restraining yourself from acting in your favor, you create the platform for the power of God to be made manifest. You create a platform for God to act in your behalf. So the apparent weakness occasioned in obedience and self-sacrifice is really a setup for the display of the power of God. It's really just a setup. God wants to display his power, but he gets us to do something that will make it impossible for us to act. So he gives us a word which in the obedience of we come into some kind of weakness in that weakened state you can't help yourself 
So we are thus ultimately advantaged in self-sacrifice and self-control. When we allow the seeming weakness which threatens or results from obedience. Now look at it. Let me give a very simple example. So you want to eat, you are hungry. You have every reason, every right to want to eat. You are hungry. You're not about to steal the food you can afford to eat. So you get about the business of feeding yourself, I mean of eating. And then here comes the word of the Lord saying, don't eat yet. Don't eat yet. You know the reason we disobey? Because not eating is going to accentuate the hunger. Not eating, we imagine, is going to put us in a state of weakness because we generally depend on food for strength. So you think if you don't eat, you are going to be weak, you are going to be distracted by hunger. And now you don't want the disadvantage of being weak, especially because you haven't eaten. So we go ahead and we eat. Yet the wisdom in self-sacrifice and self-control simply says, when you obey that word and you don't eat, yes, you position yourself in an apparent weakness. It looks like you have put yourself in some kind of weakness because the hunger is not going to go away because you didn't eat. In fact, it is going to increase. But what you have done in obeying that word is that you have created a platform for the power of God to manifest in your circumstance in some way which you don't immediately know. He may be saying don't eat yet because he knows that somebody is bringing food that is better than the one you were about to eat your way. It's also possible that he knows that one thing or the other is going to go wrong if you eat that food or if you eat at that particular. He knows. But when we obey, we give the power of God occasion, platform to manifest. So this then is wisdom. Refusing to give in to the threat of seeming weakness. I call it a threat because we recognize the possibility of being in a weak situation if we go in the direction of that principle of Christ or that commandment of We know. So you have money to pay your house rent or your children's school fees. And the word of the Lord comes saying, use it to pay for your neighbor instead. That immediately puts you in a position of weakness. It threatens you with a weakness of some sort. Your child will not be able to go to school. You will not be able to pay your rent. And we know the consequences of that. So we know the weakness that will ensue when we obey. Self-control says, restrain yourself from acting in your favor. Restrain yourself from acting in your favor. Now when you do, it becomes an expression of self-sacrifice. And the wisdom in it is that you now create a platform for the power of God to be manifest in your circumstance. The apparent weakness in obedience the weakness which results from self-sacrifice or feelings thereof is the template, the platform for the manifestation of the power of God. There is no need for the manifestation of the power if there is no weakness. What are you doing with his strength? He said his strength is made perfect in weakness. So it seems like God in his should I call it a roundabout wisdom? 
he creates a situation of weakness in our circumstance which now gives him opportunity to showcase himself. So when God says, tell my people to return to me, let us understand. Get away from the self, because it is the self that makes us to act without control. Come back to my wisdom. Every time you restrain yourself in self-control, the wisdom behind that is that now God gets to act in your favor. God gets to act in your favor. But our time is up. We must continue this tomorrow. God is asking us to return to his wisdom. And his wisdom is totally contrary to anything we can understand in this earth. His wisdom is the one that comes from above. The wisdom we generally understand is the one that comes from the earth, the one that comes from our circumstances, the one that comes from our natural senses. The wisdom that is expressed in self-control is one that positions us for the power of God to be made manifest in our circumstance. We'll do this again same time tomorrow, God willing, in the name of Jesus. Until then, control yourself. You don't have to talk. You don't have to say anything. You can walk away, you know. And that immediately gives God a challenge to act in your favor. We'll see you again same time tomorrow.